Hello, powerful people. We've all heard the term compassion. Now, most of us are pretty adept at the practice. Compassion is essentially being concerned with the alleviation of suffering. Women have a natural capacity for being compassionate. We've been conditioned to show compassion to everyone and everything, everywhere we go. The only place we are lacking in compassion is with the woman in the mirror. Self-compassion is simply compassion turned inward. Now, this facet of compassion is rarely, if ever, modeled for us, especially in the business realm. There is no room for any type of compassion in the patriarchal model of business. Now, in my humble opinion, I believe that both women and men lose in the patriarchal model, but that is a conversation for another day, and I am always up for a good patriarchy deconstruction convo. But compassion can have a tender, but also a fierce side to it. Tender self-compassion is the nurturing energy of compassion. It is the ability for us to just be with ourselves in our pain, our difficulty, and our imperfections, just as we are. It is a gentle, kind, warm energy that actually allows us to heal from our wounds as we accept ourselves and all our imperfections. Sometimes in order to alleviate our suffering, we don't actually need self-acceptance. We need to take action. At times, we need to take action to protect ourselves. Maybe someone is harming us in some way or treating us unfairly, or potentially they are crossing our lines in the sand. Sometimes self-compassion means saying no. As I like to frame it, channel your inner two-year-old. They have a no problem with saying no, do they? <laughs> <laughs> so at other times, self-compassion actually means saying yes to ourselves, providing for our needs. In other words, instead of always sacrificing ourselves for others, sometimes we need to be self-compassionate. We have to say, hey, my needs and wants count too. And finally, self-compassion can motivate change. So if we're engaged in behaviors that are harmful or in situations that are harmful to ourselves or others, quite often the compassionate thing to do is to change the behavior, to do something about the situation. This is the fierce energy of self-compassion, the power of taking action to alleviate our suffering. Tender self-compassion is like the energy of a mother caring for a crying child. It is a soft, gentle energy. I like to think that fierce self-compassion is the energy of mama bear. Fierce mama bear will stand up to protect her cubs or motivate them into doing something, you know, good little grunty talking to, or they will provide for them. All of us have access to both tender and fierce energies inside of us. Now, it's really important that tenderness and fierceness are balanced. Now, it's not so much a 50-50 type situation, but an equilibrium type situation in which what is most needed at that moment is available, on tap, on demand. You can look at it as integrated. It's kind of like the yin and yang in that we need both for wholeness and our well-being. And when they're combined, they create a type of caring force that allows us to succeed in the workplace, for instance, or to get our needs met at home, or even to make changes in the world, utilizing business as a force for good. The reason we need both is because tenderness without fierceness becomes complacency, and fierceness without tenderness becomes hostile and aggressive. Right. So when it comes to making changes, research shows us that hostility and aggressiveness are not as effective as caring for ourselves. One problem with our ability to integrate fierceness and tenderness is gender role socialization. Society's messaging to us is that boys aren't allowed to be tender, right? Boys are called derogatory names. In fact, if they show too much in the way of tenderness. No, on the other hand, Girls aren't allowed to be fierce. They're called different types of names if they're too fierce or God forbid they get angry. Am I right? And so part of really becoming our true authentic selves is being able to claim both our fierce and our tender sides, irrespective of gender role socialization. You achieve this fierce tender equilibrium by cultivating a self-compassion practice. 
Often, we're our own worst critic. When we feel anxious or frustrated, we talk to ourselves more harshly than we would find acceptable by anyone else. I really tanked that presentation. Everyone in my field is far more dynamic than I am. They have so much more to offer a potential client than I do, right? Would we ever allow anyone else or sit around for very long if someone else were saying the same things directed at us? See, we wrongly assume that criticism will motivate us to do better. We become even more of a perfectionist than usual. Instead of talking to ourselves with self-compassion, we raise our standards for our behavior as a defense against our feelings of doubt, anxiety, and frustration. People who are self-compassionate recover better from psychological knocks like relationship breakups or career setbacks. One way to show your self-compassion is through self-talk. So here's what that is and how it works. There are four elements of self-compassion. One is using a tone of kindness. Another is recognizing that pain is a universal human experience. Another part to self-compassion is taking a balanced approach to our negative emotions that neither suppresses or exaggerates them. And fourth, it's expecting yourself to make the best decision you can in the situation you're in. Compassionate self-talk can be a gentle and supportive nudge, as in tender self-compassion, or it can be along the lines of a more fierce end of the spectrum in which we call ourselves on, let's say, our procrastination. Hello, I'm Sam Graber, and I am a procrastinator. Procrastination is nothing more than a momentary stress-relieving behavior, so dig into what's causing the stress and call it out. For example, I might need to sit my butt on my exercise ball, which is my desk chair, and I need to finish a weekly article, let's say. So in this scenario, I might say to myself, you don't want to start because you're anxious. That's understandable. You want to do a solid job. The best way to do a good job is to chip away at it. You don't have to work on all of it all day long. Work in time chunks. Aim for two sessions today. Let it percolate overnight and then final edit it in the morning. Now say my work tends to expand into the time allowed, also known as sliding in right at the deadline. Anyone else feel me on that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes self-compassionate talk is reframing a trait or tendency like perfectionism. Use it to prevent psyching yourself out and letting perfect be the enemy of done. Perfectionists are less likely to be self-compassionate. Takes one to know one but I'm working on it, right? So self-compassion can help you take a more balanced view of yourself and see when everything is in fact not great. Say your performance on a project, but everything is in fact not terrible. Your entire career is not a flop. See, a perfectionist might say to themselves, I have to get this right first try or I'll never get another opportunity. That attitude can make starting at all feel too daunting. It's a lot resting on that. Someone who is self-compassionate might say to themselves, everyone has blind spots that result in first attempts being imperfect. I don't have to get everything right all on my own. I can use others' perspectives. That's how great work happens. So let's bring self-compassion to the goal setting process, more specifically on how you word your goals and then hold yourself accountable to reaching them. On the flip side of self-compassion is self-judgment. I talked about this in episode 51 of the Unraveling Together podcast. Self-judgment is a default button for far too many. I call it self-judgment purgatory, and you can listen to that episode on your favorite podcast streaming platform or from the podcast page of drsamgraber.com. That's D-R-S-A-M-G-R-A-B-E-R.com. So how you write your goals matters. Whether the goal is geared towards business or your personal life, the tone in which you write will either ignite you into action or cause you to recoil in dread. There's not much gray area here. Lose 30 pounds, close 100K in business this quarter, publish a weekly blog post. For some, direct, concrete wording is motivating, gets the job done. For others, wording goals in such a manner makes them want to give up before they've even started. If you find yourself in the latter category, a kinder, more self-compassionate approach to wording your goals may be the best way for you to go about setting your goals.